this Miss D. And in this presentation, we are going to take a look at the fight for civil rights for African Americans. We're going to specifically look at the uh, civil rights era of the 1950s. And I, I just before I even get started, I just got to remind you that this fight for civil rights, you know, this does not happen in a vacuum, that African Americans, you know, have been fighting this prejudice and fighting mistreatment for hundreds of years. Um, between slavery and then segregation, what goes on for almost 100 years. And, you know, still the fight for civil rights continues to today. Um, bear in mind, this is a topic that could be the subject, not even of a college class. I mean, this is could be a college major and you wouldn't even scratch the surface. And meanwhile, I'm going to talk about this topic in, you know, 40 minutes. So I'm not going to do, uh, this is going to be really quick and down and dirty and, you know, my apologies for it. Uh, I definitely encourage you to seek out additional information if you're interested in the topic. I'll do my best. But like I said, it's it's not going to be an exhaustive look. So my apologies in advance for, for flying through this. All right. Remember, when we're talking in the 1950s, this is the era where segregation still exists. It is 100% constitutional to keep black and white people separate. That you can say, I will only hire white people for this job. I'll say, hello, black person, you must use that water fountain or must sit in this part of the bus. It's completely legal. Um, and uh, th this type of segregation, now, this segregation, this type of Jim Crow segregation exists in the South. That's segregation by law, where there's literally laws about keeping black and white people separate. Now, Bear in mind, it's not like, oh, the South is so evil and the North is perfect. Don't get it twisted. In the North, you still have segregation. But that's what's known as de facto segregation. What ends up happening is there are housing patterns established because of the way mortgages are financed, because of restrictive covenants that are written into housing agreements. Um, you end up having like black neighborhoods and white neighborhoods. And what this is going to end up creating so if you have a white neighborhood and a black neighborhood and people aren't living together in the same areas well by definition in the white neighborhood kids go to a white school and in the black neighborhood kids go to a black school they're not going to a segregated school because it's the law they're going to a segregated school because that's how it works out because that's how people live and they go to the neighborhood school and then it puts you get what i'm saying so that you end up still having segregation but it's not because of the law it's just because it's how people live and the kind of circumstances um but anyway, so this is an issue all over the country. But like I said, for the 1950s, they're really going to focus on segregation by law that's really happening um, in the South. And, of course, the civil rights struggle is influenced by World War II. A lot of people tie it into that. Kind of very similar to what we talked about in World War I. You know, you have soldiers who are off in Europe fighting for democracy and then come home and get treated like garbage, like second-class citizens. So there's, um, you know, that was that whole movement of the Double V campaign, that, you know, victory, you know, uh, victory in the war and victory at home um, to, again, push for more rights for African Americans. In addition, don't forget, during World War II, FDR had said he had forbid segregation in the defense industries. He allowed black and white people to work together because he needed goods produced for the war. So, you know, you'd already had this kind of government um, intervention to prevent segregation, to have to give equal employment to uh, white and black. Uh, moving forward, though, in 1948, Again, the government is going to step up. This time it's going to be with the military, that President Truman, we're in the midst of the Cold War, which we're going to talk about later in more detail. And, you know, his focus is making the country very strong. So uh, he needs to increase the strength of the military. He signs an executive order. So that means he doesn't need approval by Congress. He doesn't need to get it through and get it voted on. It's an executive order. And he says, I'm the leader of the armed forces, and therefore the armed forces are no longer going to be segregated. So white and black people will serve together in the same units. So this is kind of, again, this is creating more momentum towards segregation. But the biggest thing and the most important thing that comes out during this hour, like one of the, the you know, big turning point is the Brown v. Board of Education case in the Supreme Court. Truly, you must know Brown v. Board of Education. It, it, not because it's on a test, like as an American, as somebody who's not like a complete knucklehead, like you, you just, Brown v. Board of Education is, is famous. 
and it's an incredibly important case. It is the one where Thurgood Marshall, he was the lead attorney, and he argued successfully that um, separate schools for white and blacks is unconstitutional, that it is inherently, by its very nature, segregation creates inequality. And the big way and the very famous way they were able to illustrate that was with the doll test. Long, long story short, um, basically they showed, they gave these tests to like black children. They brought them in. They show them a black doll and a white doll. And when they ask, you know, who's the pretty doll? Who's the smart doll? Who's the good doll? They would point to the white doll. When they say, who's the bad doll? Who's the dumb doll? Who's, you know, they would point to the black doll. And it, just showing that these kinds of prejudices, this kind of racism, that, you know, this is what segregation causes. Now, just to let you know, they still have done, they've done the, this doll test. They've done it more recently. And attitudes are starting to change. If you do that uh, doll test with African-American children, they, they don't, they tend to now, um, like they, they don't necessarily have that same level of prejudice that a black, that a black child will look at the black doll and they'll think it's smart and good. And, you know, that's not too much of an issue. Um, however, they still see it with white children, especially white children, because like I said, there's, even though there isn't segregation by law, because many children in this country live in white, you know, many white children live in white neighborhoods, but they don't have, you know, a lot of white friends and they're still you know, because of that, they, they don't have that opportunity to break down those prejudices. They still see more white children saying, oh, the smart, pretty, good doll is the white doll and the bad one is the, is the dark doll. Um, but it's starting to get better. It's changing, but it's, it's not where it should be. So uh, it's still an issue. But if you're interested, there's a lot of videos on YouTube uh, and plenty of websites. You can just look up the doll test. All right. So you have the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court says, OK, no more segregation for schools can no longer be segregated. If you're going to have a school, it has to be white and black children have to go to school together. So naturally, Supreme Court can make that decision. But, you know, the, the you know, the local schools are like, yeah, yeah, whatever. You know, they just ignore it. Um, you may remember Andrew Jackson did the same thing when the when the Supreme Court said, you know, uh, you have to treat, you know, remember with the, the case about the Indian nations being treated as sovereign. You know, and he was like, I'll let them enforce their decision. Same idea here. That was the Worcester case um, here. Same thing that the Supreme Court makes this decision that forbids segregation and the basically the states are just ignore it. So that's why you had to actually have a second board decision in 1955, basically telling the states, um, you, you, no more time. You, you've run out of time. Get this, get the show on the road. You have to, you have to desegregate your schools like yesterday. Um, so naturally somebody has to be the first, somebody has to be the, the, the black child who goes to school at a white school. And so this is what happens in Arkansas. In Arkansas, you have the Little Rock Nine, okay? In the Little Rock, Arkansas. So these nine children are going to desegregate the white high school. And it, it goes as terrible as you'd think it would. Um, they head over to the school. They're attacked by the citizens, the cops, the local cops won't help them. In fact, they bar them from school. Like, I don't know what they think nine teenagers are going to do in a school building that they're so dangerous, but they keep them out and they don't let them go to school. And literally it, it's a 17 day stay off, a standoff where the, the, the government, the local government of the state, they won't let these kids in. It takes the federal government, it takes the president sending federal troops in to enforce this law. He, he can't trust the local police to do it. He has to send in federal troops, literally, to escort these kids into the school building. I'm, I, you know, you can think about what George Washington did. Remember when people tried to ignore the, the law from the federal law when they tried to pass the taxes, right? And he had to bring out his own militia. Might remind you of the Whiskey Rebellion. Same idea that, that the, the federal government has to actually enforce this, uh, this decision. Um, so that was the Little Rock Nine. Uh, another famous person of this era is Ruby Bridges. You know, the Little Rock Nine desegregated the high schools. Ruby Bridges was uh, a girl who desegregated the grammar school. All right. So um, throughout this course, we've looked at a lot of leaders in the African-American community. We looked, you know, very early on at Frederick Douglass. Then we talked about Booker T. Washington. We talked about W.E.B. Du Bois. During this 1950s civil rights era, the two big 
famous, you know, speakers are really Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. I'm tell you straight out, the Regents only cares about Martin Luther King Jr. He's, you know, of course, famous for his stand, um, kind of following Gandhi's model, for those of you who've had global history, of using nonviolence and civil disobedience to create change. Um, and his goal is he really wants an integrated society with black and whites, you know, living together and, and with greater civil rights for African Americans. Uh, what he's famous for is his letter from Birmingham jail. This is where he basically argues in favor of the need for civil disobedience. He does that very famous I have a dream speech. Um, and, you know, people kind of, you know, today he's like the sainted figure. Um, and, and legitimately so. I'm not, I'm not trying to take away from it. Um, but I will say at the end of his, you know, at the end of his life, you know, before he is assassinated, he does come out, you know, and really argue that the civil rights struggle, you know, is still ongoing, that he argues that you have to do more. And uh, especially around the area of income inequality, that African-Americans are are um, uh, dis uh, that are, are not as financially that they're they're uh, not financially equal to white people and that, you know, more has to be done to to help them. And he's also very much against the, the Vietnam War, because, of course, a lot of African-Americans are forced to fight. Um, and that makes him a little less popular, and then he's going to get assassinated. Another leader of the era is also Malcolm X. Um, if you're interested in him, you know, I encourage you to go look for further information. But um, he preaches more. He's less in favor of integration because he's not sure that it would actually work. He's more in favor. He kind of follows that uh, Marcus Garvey a model of black nationalism, of black pride. And he, um, but he, later in his life, he kind of mellows out. He is a Muslim. And as you may be aware, if you are a follower of Islam, one of the things you do is you, you make a pilgrimage to Mecca. And when he makes a pilgrimage to Mecca, he's actually able to see, and he experiences himself, like basically whites and blacks, Muslims, like getting along and treating each other equally and, and it really is a very eye-opening experience for him because, of course, being an, an African-American in the United States, he's, he wasn't used to that. And when he has this experience at Mecca, it's, it kind of changes him and, kind of, and he starts to mellow out his views and he's a little bit more open to the idea of integration. But he's then assassinated. Anyway, um, you know, like I said, I encourage you to learn more about both of them. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. speeches. I'm sure you've heard these. You've studied in middle school. I mean, we have MLK Day and you're going to hear it. The I have a dream speech about, you know, I have a dream that one nation will rise out and, and, and um, that on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit together, sit down together at a table of brotherhood. That was the big speech. Um, and then I've been to the mountaintop. This is another one. I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. And this speech is, of course, always poignant because people say, you know, it, it's almost like he knows that he's going to be assassinated. Like he, he knows it's, it's, it's a possibility. So it's always pretty sad when people, you know, like the way that he said it, like kind of acknowledging, like, listen, I may not even live in long enough to be able to see this come to fruition. So, um, all right, now we're going to talk about something really depressing, which is the Emmett Till murder of 1955. Um, you guys know uh, that we've been talking about um, lynching and how this has been, uh, you know, uh, something that's been going on for like a hundred years in the country. That really, within you know, basically right after the Civil War, you know, in that Reconstruction era, it's been go going on and on and on. And the NAACP, which was you know founded, you know in what was like early 1900s uh, you know or even earlier than that yeah somewhere around there that the NACB has been fighting to try to get laws passed and you know it just it's but yet it's still not stopping it's still uh African Americans especially in the south and in the border states are like basically victims of domestic terrorism and this has been ongoing and it really is just ignored so Emmett Till is a kid. He actually grows up in the north, but he was visiting family down south. He was 14 years old and a white woman accused him of like whistling to her, or flirting with her, some nonsense. Long story short, the white woman, meanwhile, on her deathbed was like, yeah, I made up the whole thing. I mean, there's got to be a special place in hell for this woman. But she accuses him and basically, you know, for whatever he did, the little flirting or whistling or whatever it is, that that is somehow 
makes it appropriate to give this kid the death penalty, basically. So they grab this kid. Um, he's kidnapped. He's beaten. He's shot. He's, his corpse is thrown into a river. He is brutalized. He's not just killed. I mean, he is tortured and then killed for something ridiculous, something very, very minor. Now, there was tons of evidence. They knew who did it. And the people got off scot-free. They were all white. The, the all white male jury says, oh, no, not enough evidence. And they let them go free. Um, and meanwhile, right after that, they did an interview with some magazine and they were bragging about, you know, white justice and protecting their white women and blah, blah, blah. like they had no shame about this. Now, what ends up happening is here's the thing. I, OK, forget as a teacher. I'm going to tell you as a mom, OK, as a mom. And I'm sure you'll you'll hear this from your parents as well. The most horrible thing I could ever think about in my life is the idea that I will outlive my children. You know what I'm saying? That should, you, you never, as a parent, you, you don't, you never want to outlive your children. You, your children should live beyond you, right? And the idea that my children would die before me, that I would have to see my kids and bury my children is, is painful. The idea that my children would suffer, like the fact that they would be in pain before they die. You know what I'm saying? Like, the idea, like, you know, that my, my baby, my 14 year old, I mean, he's the, he's the age of like a kid who's at the end of middle school, beginning of high school, that he died alone, that he was, he may have been calling out for me, that he suffered before he died. I can't, like, it makes me sick. Like I literally, when I teach this, I get teary eyed because I think of, of how his mother seeing his body, seeing what happened to her son must have just the unbelievable suffering she must have felt. I, my, I feel sick for her. Um, I, I can't even, I can't even wrap my mind around it. And yet this woman, Emma Till's mother, she did, she fought tooth and nail. She fought to get her child's body back from the authorities because they wanted to just uh, burn him and just do a quick burial and just, you know, hide it and get past it. And a lot of people would have just been so caught up in their grief that they would have just been like, whatever, and kind of moved on. But she said, no, she's like, I'll let the world see what these people did to my baby. And she fought to get her child's body back. She brought his body back to Chicago, back to where they live from Mississippi, back to Chicago. And she had an open casket funeral. Again, having her child having to see how much like the, the physical evidence of her child's suffering. And she was willing to do that. And she allowed a magazine to publish photographs of her son's body and of herself while she was in the worst grief imaginable. I, this woman is, I just think of her as just such a, just such a strong woman. I just, I, I, it goes beyond words. I can't even put into words anyway. All right. So look, I'm just, for purposes of you understanding how severe this was, because this really is a turning point in the civil rights movement, I'm going to show you a before and after picture of Emmett Till. I'm not doing it to be lascivious or, you know, whatever. I don't want to be disrespectful to him and to his memory and what he went through. Um, these are pictures that were published in a national magazine, so they were out in public. But if you get easily disturbed, I'm not looking to give kids nightmares. I'm not looking to gross you out. So if you have a if you have a, a sensitive stomach or you're a sensitive kid, close your eyes. Don't watch this part. I'll let you know when you can look again. Just look away from your screen. I'll tell you when you can. Okay. But for those of you who are ready, here you go. That's the before and after picture of this 14 year old kid. Can you imagine this? And that's what they did to him. And like, this is the photograph you can see on the left that was published in Jet Magazine where she is just looking at her child. I can't. All right. You guys can look again. I took off the picture. But anyway, uh, like I said, I can't even imagine what this woman went through. So as people are looking in this magazine, I mean, you can imagine, like the outrage. And this has been going on for like 100 years. This, this, this is not the first time there's been a lynching. There's been lynching and there's been children who've been lynched throughout. Like this is, this, this is not the first teenager that this happened to. But the fact that it was, just, it was just this beautiful child who had just been tortured. It was just so obvious in the photos and, and put it out there. It just sparked so much anger and it really 
feeds this civil rights movement. I mean, it gets people so angry that they're like, all right, we're, we're, we're fighting. We're ready to fight. Like, and just, it just gets people so angry. It gets them really motivated and, and gets them to, to act. And it, it's not a coincidence. I mean, a hundred days later, a hundred days after the death of Emmett Till, that's when you get Rosa Parks. And you know, Rosa Parks, I'm sure you all know that she was the one who was arrested for not moving from the seat. And, you know, she was sitting in the front seat of the bus instead of the back and she got arrested. And this comes, like I said, just in the wake of Emmett Till. So that anger of Emmett Till. And now you had Rosa Parks and it just, this movement keeps mowing. So when Rosa Parks is arrested, that leads to the Montgomery bus boycott. And where you have, I mean, for that boycott to work, you need hundreds and hundreds, all the thousands of African-Americans to not ride the bus. That's a nightmare. It's a, you, people got to get back and forth to work. People got to move. They don't have their own cars. And yet everybody was like, I'm going to do something. And this is something I can do. And they boycott the buses and it works. It actually works. They, it's the district court there um, ended up uh, ruling that racial segregation on buses was unconstitutional in Montgomery, Alabama. And this boycott was actually led by Martin Luther King Jr. This is really one of the first times he's going to take that leadership role, you know, and become this leader of the movement. And, and I'm telling you, that was, that's a pretty tough gig to have because you, you step into that and you know, there was a bullseye on you. I mean, Martin Luther King Jr.'s house was bombed. He got death threats, you know, but he went into it and he says, no, it's, I'll, I'll be the man. I'll be the face of this movement. Um, okay, so there's many other movements. That was one. So we had Rosa Parks and we had the Montgomery Bus Point Cat. There's many other organizations um, that use civil disobedience. Um, for example, this is the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Um, they engage in civil disobedience where they would put, uh, it was white and black uh teenagers usually pretty young people usually and they would sit at the lunch counters and specifically to desegregate them so they would sit so african americans would sit at the lunch counter it was supposed to be a white only lunch counter and they would sit there and as you can see from the photos they'd be verbally physically just abused and arrested and but they kept doing these sit-ins um and it, it it worked by not late 1960s you start seeing that lunch counters become desegregated Another one, 1961, this was the Freedom Riders. And again, you have more of these young students coming in. They rode buses, black and white, were riding the public buses to force them to integrate. And as you can see in the top left, they would be arrested. Uh, they were, you know, the buses were bombed. This was, this was dangerous stuff. When you were fighting for civil rights in this era, you were not just, you know, this isn't like today where people like type up something on, you know, Facebook or on social media, like I'm so outraged. I mean, people really, it was dangerous to do this stuff. Um, and again, here, at least it was JFK, I think, who was in, in office at this time. He, uh, he does support the Freedom Riders and they are able to get a victory that the Interstate Commerce Committee does ban segregation and travel facilities, waiting rooms, all of that, you know, associated with interstate travel. Uh, another really tragic, tragic event of this era is the church bombing. Um, the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama it was a black congregation. It's a church where a lot of the civil rights era leaders would go. You got to remember uh, Martin Luther King Jr. was a Baptist minister. So a lot of these civil rights um, movement was kind of through the churches. And these were like where they got organized, where they would meet and so on. So meanwhile, they bombed the church when there were 200 people inside, including children. So these four young girls on the bottom left, they were killed. Okay. Now, tragic loss of life. And yet, what's really just disgusting about it is the FBI knew. There is evidence that came out that J. Edgar Hoover, who hated the civil rights movement. I mean, he had, he had files on Martin Luther King Jr. and on Malcolm X and, you know, the, the federal government, like he saw these people as enemies to the country. Um, he had evidence that this was, that there would be a bombing, didn't do anything. Uh, they did, they, they knew there was lots of evidence about who committed it. These KKK members committed this act. Meanwhile, never brought to trial, not convicted. Um, not until, as you can see, 2001, 2002 is when they finally get convicted for this 1963 bombing. Meanwhile, one of the guys was already dead because he had been so old. So, um, again, it was, like I said, it, if you were engaged in the civil rights work, it was no joke. It was very dangerous. 
Uh, Birmingham, 1963. This was an attempt to desegregate the city of Alabama in uh, Alabama, in Birmingham, Alabama. Now, the thing about Birmingham, Alabama, it has the strongest and most violent chapters of the KKK are located in Alabama. The governor, George Wallace, as well as the police commissioner, Bull Connor, were infamous racists. I mean, very much against any of the civil rights movement. So when these protesters come to the city, they let loose, as you can see in the photo, they use the, they, they put the sick, the police dogs on them. They use water hoses on them just, and again, they're, the constitution says that African-Americans are, have citizenship rights, that there's equality. I mean, according to, you know, the 13th, 14th, 15th amendment, they're not asking for anything that's illegal. And yet they're treated just the violence that's met with. It's, it's insane. Um, and what ends up happening is, is that this is broadcast on TV. I mean, I, I just have still pictures, but people watch this in video um, on their TV sets and they're disgusted and they're shocked and they're horrified by this. And again, you know, they, they are people are really outraged and kind of trying to sh change um public opinion about segregation about it um this is also this is it's in this setting that uh, martin luther king jr writes letter from a birmingham jail which like i said is basically his argument in favor of the need for civil disobedience and um, president kennedy again is going to back this uh civil rights legislation all right another group in addition to the naacp which is one of the main ones and some of the other ones we looked at another group you may see references to is the southern christian leadership conference so again this is another group that uses nonviolent mass action with both black and and white members people of all races freedom summer here's another one um the freedom summer was about increasing voting um and helping disenfranchised voters especially mississippi um, that was where their focus was, trying to get African Americans in Mississippi to register for vote and to exercise their right to vote. And so they were traveling. It was black and white activists who, you know, usually young college kids coming from the north, traveling down south to, to help. And um, three of them were murdered. Three of them were murdered. Um, there's a movie about it, uh, about these guys being murdered. Um, as also part of Freedom Summer, and part of this movement to acknowledge and recognize the disenfranchisement of African Americans in Mississippi, you also have the 1964 Democratic Convention. What ends up happening is you guys may remember when we talked about um, the Civil War, right? And you remember we talked about the, uh, you know, during Reconstruction, and we talked about uh, the rise of the Democratic Party, that the radical Republicans were the ones who supported African-Americans, but the Democratic Party made no secret of the fact that it was a party of white people and it was very anti-black. Remember that whole thing? So what happens is now in the 1960s, there are Southern Democrats who are straight up, no holds bars, hardcore racist. Like that's part of their thing. And Southern Democrats hold on to their positions because they are... They disenfranchise black people. They don't let black people vote because of all the Jim Crow laws, right? The poll taxes and, and you know, the, the literacy tests, as well as just using violence to scare the hell out of people who push too hard, you know, the KKK and all that. So what happens is, as during the Freedom Summer, people come, these, uh, these groups, the, the, they come to the Democratic Convention and they really challenge the Democratic Party and say, hey, the Democratic Party, why are you allowing these delegates chosen in Mississippi to, to come to this party. These delegates were not chosen democratically. They, they, they're, they got their position because they kept black people from voting. You as a party, the Democratic Party needs to stand up and chastise your members. You need to tell Democrats in Mississippi that that's not acceptable. You have to take a stand on this. And so they're trying to challenge this, the, the way the delegates were chosen because they were clearly chosen only by white voters in Mississippi. And as part of this, they asked this woman, see on the bottom left, Fannie Lou Hammer, she was giving a speech about what she went through, the violence that was used to keep African-Americans in Mississippi from voting. And real heartfelt speech, it's pretty deep. And lo and behold, what happens? The president, he's a Democrat. He doesn't want people, you know, he's got to support his party. Because of course, the Democratic Party was like, okay, yeah, they're racist, but we still want their votes and we don't want to lose you know, that bastion of support. So they don't want to offend the Southern Democrats. So they don't, they end up cutting off her speech. Like she gets interrupted by a speech from the president. She's cut off. So it's not broadcast. 
I, you know, it was, it was it, that was pretty messed up. But all right, moving forward, 1963, that's the March on Washington. This may look very familiar. So this is 250,000 people, over 250,000 people. That's a quarter of a million people in Washington, D.C. for this March on Washington. And this is where King delivers his very, very famous I Have a Dream speech, which I'm sure you're uh, aware of. In 1965, here's another big, uh, a big action, which was the march from Selma to Montgomery the subject of a recent movie, if you know the movie Selma. And again, this is one more that's focused on the disenfranchisement of African Americans in the South. Remember, if you get the franchise, to have the franchise means you have the right to vote, okay? So um, they, when you say you disenfranchise somebody, it means you are not giving them the right to vote. So this is what they were fighting for. And this march from Selma to Alabama helps, this is in support of passing the Voting Rights Act of 1965. All right, the Black Panther Party, I Chihuahua. All right, this one is, all right, I want to give you a heads up about this one because this is an organization that um, there's a lot of differing opinions on the Black Panther Party and there's a lot of misinformation about it and things like that. So if you're interested, I definitely encourage you to seek out more information and make your own determination. Here's the thing. The Black Panther Party is formed in Oakland, California. And its specific focus is on um, police brutality, okay? Now, you guys know, even today, we have the whole Black Lives Matter movement because there have been many innocent, unarmed black people who are being shot by the police in numbers much greater than is happening to other races. People are like, hmm, I see a pattern. And I... I'm sorry, but I can't, I can't imagine anybody who's like, oh, yeah, that's fine. I, I, you know, if you ask a cop, what do you think about killing, you know, an innocent, unarmed white person, you know, black person? Oh, great idea. I mean, no, what do you, nuts? I mean, how, who can be pro, you know, shooting people that, that don't deserve it? You get what I'm saying? Like, it's a messed up thing. So this group, back in today, we have this issue, but back then it was way worse. Okay. The, the, you know, today there's a, been like some effort to, to kind of clean up the police force, but back then forget about it. So, um, what happens is the Black Panther Party starts and one of their, one of the ways they deal with, um, police brutality is, is that they would, you know, for example, like they would hear about somebody getting arrested and California was an open carry state. So any of you who've seen some of these protests, you know, the guys who walk around with the AK, you know, 47, you know, the AR-15s and big guns and they walk around, they'll go and they can do it in public and just carry big guns publicly. And that's how California was, that that was perfectly legal. As long as you didn't hide it, you could walk around with whatever gun you wanted. And so what the Black Panther Party would do is they would hear the radio and if they heard somebody was being arrested, they would kind of show up. And you would have all these Black Panthers holding these big, powerful guns, like you see them in the top left, and like standing there watching the cops arrest somebody. And they'd even do these moves where they go, you know, when you load a, a round in the chamber, you click, click, you know what I mean? Like they're click, click the gun and they're kind of holding it up. And, you know, basically telling, the, you know, sending a message to the cops, watch what you're doing. We, we're watching you. We're watching you making sure what you're doing. Now, if you're an African-American getting arrested, this may be very comforting to you. Now, if you're a cop, you're like, what the hell? I'm going to get killed here. Uh, you know, it's got to be really scary. Um, and you're like, dude, I'm just doing my job. You know, the guy broke the law. What do you want me to do? So, you know, there's there's a bit of a disconnect on that end. Um, that wasn't the only thing the Black Panther Party did. The Black Panther Party did have a lot of programs, like it had a free lunch program and they opened schools. And, you know, it was this kind of more of a black nationalist, you know, movement in the sense that African-Americans should seek out opportunities to improve and help people in their own communities. Very, very positive. Um, by the same token, by the end of the movement, you know, the FBI had targeted them and there's some, you know, there's controversy about how much, um, you know, whether there was entrapment or what have you, but, you know, the Black Panther Party by the end, it's very violent. There are many violent show showdowns with the police where people are shooting and cops get killed and you know so 
for a lot of people, they look at this group like it's a terrorist organization, like they were attacking cops and they, you know, resulted in people's deaths and it was a very, very dangerous organization. Other people look at the same organization and they look at, you know, hey, it was coming from a legitimate place of legitimate concern about police brutality and look at all the positive social programs and, you know, they, they blame the FBI for it and blah, blah, blah. So it's definitely a very mixed bag, strong opinions on both sides, strong opinions on both sides. Um, I'm not going to tell you what to think. You got to make your own choice. I strongly encourage, please, there's a ton of videos, a lot of information out there. Make sure you look for a legitimate news source, please. Don't don't go to like Jimmy Bob Bo's, you know, myblog.org and think you're going to get a legitimate news source. But um, but it's, uh, please study more. And, and if you have questions, usually I show some videos and have some further detail about this, but we can, if you're interested, let me know and I'll, I'll give you some more, uh, I'll give you some resources to take a look at. All right. So with that, let's switch gears. We're going to take a look at the civil rights laws and Supreme Court decisions that come out of this era. All right. First things first is affirmative action. This is, again, another executive action. This is something that the president signs, doesn't need any approval, doesn't go through. This isn't a law passed by the Senate or with the legislative branch or any of that. This is just an executive action. And basically, the president requires that um, employers make an effort, affirmative effort to you know, make sure that there is no prejudice in hiring and things like that. Um, and what ends up happening is affirmative action is this program where basically you're trying to give more opportunities to African-Americans in both employment and in education. Now, the thinking is this, if you look at the top left, um, you know, as we saw, you remember in that first slide where I started, African-Americans, you know, between slavery and then, you know, the horrors of segregation and, and everything that they've been through, there are government actions. I mean, this isn't just bad luck. This is specific actions taken or actions and inactions from the government to not protect African-Americans. Um, they're not protecting their physical safety, not protecting their political rights, um, and basically standing in the way of African-Americans having access to education, having access to growing wealth and things like that. And so, you know, in this sense, it, being equal wouldn't exactly be fair, right? If, if whites and other uh, minority groups have, you know, had a head start in building wealth and being able to create businesses and, and having more social acceptance, and there's one group that's kind of been held back, if you say, okay, we're going to take away the barriers, you're already like, you know, you're way behind all the other groups. So the idea of affirmative action is like, look, we got to help you catch up. Like you need to have a leg up. And then once you have the leg up, then then maybe down the road it can be fair. But for now, we need to help you catch up to everybody else. Um, and that's the idea of affirmative action. Today, however, there's a lot of controversy about this. People are really uncomfortable because, um, and and not just not just white people, it, it, black people too. But there is um, and other minority groups because I, I know Asians are also like, hey, listen, we we had it really bad too. Don't forget, we're the first. You know, Asian Americans are the first ones who had. Uh, discrimination in, in um, you remember the, the, the Chinese Exclusion Act and a lot of racism they were subject to. Um, so there's a, a lot of controversy about this, that, for example, when it comes to deciding who should go to a school, should it just be based on merit or should you give certain groups a leg up? And so a lot of controversy. A lot of people say, listen, maybe there was a time for this in the 70s, um, but, you know, we're in 2020. Let's move on. You know what I mean? Other people are like, what are you kidding me? Nineteen uh, sixties? That's 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 not a million years ago. Like, I, like I said, my grandfather fought in World War II. I was born in nineteen seventy. This isn't like a million billion years ago. This is like one, we're not even one generation removed. My mom is still alive, and she's you know she grew up with segregation. You know, like give me a break. It, you might need a little bit more time on the clock. So. There's a debate. There's a debate on how much it's still needed and whether or not it's fair and so on and so forth. Um, I will say this. And again, I'm not going to tell you what to think. You make whatever decision you want. But I will tell you this. Um, affirmative action. This is from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. So I'm going to go with them. That African-Americans, so blacks who benefited from affirmative action. So that means like, look, when it came time to decide who gets to go to college, OK, if you look straight at grades, you, you know, or what have you, you may not have given the opportunity to an, to an African-American student. But now you say, all right, listen, I'm going to give you a leg up. I'm going to open the door. I'm going to let a couple of extra African-American students in who normally wouldn't. 
because of affirmative action policies. What ends up happening is those those black students who had those opportunities, who got a chance to go into the white schools or, you know, had these opportunities to seek higher education because of affirmative action. They said it actually it worked. It worked. Um, long term, the African-American students who benefited from affirmative action did, in fact, you know, graduate college at a much higher rate. They ended up earning professional degrees like masters and PhDs and have much higher incomes and that. This was a big engine for social mobility. That's why you're going to have more African-Americans entering the middle class and the upper class because they're able to get access to this educational opportunities. And long term, that means you'll be able to make more money. And that means you're going to give your kids a better opportunity to make more money and so on and so forth. And because of this, giving more opportunities, this is going to lead to more diverse leadership, that not every CEO or manager or, you know, person in charge has to be a white man. You know what I'm saying? So, like I said, it's still an issue for debate about, you know, because I, I'll tell you, there's some African-Americans who don't like affirmative action. They say, listen, I earn my spot legit, you know, free and clear. And meanwhile, you walk onto a campus of people like, oh, you're just here because you're black. You know, you just got here because of affirmative action. So, I, you know, I've heard people who don't like it who are African-American too. Um, but like I said, I'm not going to tell you what to think. Take a look into it, but um, it's something to consider. All right, another piece of law. This is the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Now, this should sound familiar because this is very similar to the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which President Grant tried to pass during Reconstruction. And you may remember it passed and then the Supreme Court found it unconstitutional because this was a law, the Civil Rights Act of 1875, uh, you know, said that discrimination would be illegal and, and it was overturned by the Supreme Court. But in 1964, thankfully, you know, finally, oh my goodness, what is this? Oh, like almost, almost a hundred years later, right? Almost. Um, you finally get a Civil Rights Act that passed that finally... It, it makes it illegal to discriminate based on race, religion, national origin, or and gender as well. Um, now, by the time this pa law passes, JFK had already been shot. He'd been assassinated. So we have a new president. Lyndon Johnson is the one who, who signs this uh, Civil Rights Act. All right, another important one. This is a Supreme Court case, Heart of Atlanta Motel versus the United States. This is the one that outlaws segregation when it comes to public accommodation. So that means like if you go to stay in a motel or a hotel or anything like that, that um, you, you can't discriminate based on race. All right, this may look familiar. This is um, a poll tax receipt. This is from this is dated from 1952 um, that this woman tried to vote and she had to pay money to be able to vote. OK, so she had to pay uh, she had to pay all this money. Uh, and this was one way poll tax was one example of how African-Americans were disenfranchised. Right. And this was happening in Texas. Um, yeah, Wichita, Wichita, Kansas. Well, finally, in 1964, we get the 24th Amendment where poll taxes are declared unconstitutional. So, again, this is a way to attack these Jim Crow era laws, which were keeping African-Americans from being able to access the vote. Um, you also get 1965, the Voting Rights Act, which, again, eliminates any state law that does anything to keep black people from voting. Now, what's interesting is in 2013, a section of this act was found unconstitutional. Um, so now what happens is, is some of these states, which uh, according to the Voting Rights Act, they, they had been kind of under kind of federal oversight for how they manage the voting process, um, they're given more leeway now. One of the issues that's coming up right now and is kind of working its way through the courts is they're starting to see that some of these places that have a history of um, segregation and, you know, bad history of, of these kind of racist and, and disenfranchising African-Americans, they're starting to see in these neighborhoods, uh, you know, that you go to a black neighborhood and yeah, they don't have as many polling places as they used to. That suddenly, you know, in certain neighborhoods, the polling places, the machines don't work as good or they shut down too early or the, the lines go out the door for a couple, you know. So it's, there's, there's some issues there about, um, you know, about the Voting Rights Act and whether or not it's, 
uh, that it may, we may need to take a second look at it. We may have to bring it back. But um, again, I definitely encourage you to, to seek out more information yourself. I mean, some people, this is a big thing too. We're currently debating that idea of whether or not you need to use voter ID. Now, some people legitimately say, hey, listen, voting is really important that, you know, why, what's the big deal? Why wouldn't you want to use identification? This is something really critically important to our country. And, you know, why not show a piece of ID? And other people say, um, yeah, OK, but here's the deal. When you force people to show ID before they vote, um, it's it affects a lot of African-Americans who don't have access to these IDs, these forms of IDs that you would accept, that there really isn't an issue with, you know, illegal people voting. Um, there's really no record of it. The, the numbers are, you know, almost non-existent. There's really no proof that there, this has been an issue. Um, and uh if there's no, but there definitely has been a lot of data that shows that it keeps, it disenfranchises a lot of people, but there isn't evidence that it, you know, that there's been like this kind of criminal, you know, people like too many people voting. I mean, for goodness sakes, the rate of voting in this country is like criminally small. It's like pathetically small. There's such a small percentage of Americans actually vote who are entitled to vote. So anyway, it's going back and forth. But like I said, this is definitely a hot topic um, in the news. So definitely look into it. All right, 1967, this is the Loving versus Virginia case, and a more appropriately named case there never will be. The Loving versus Virginia case basically makes it unconstitutional to uh, pass laws that forbid interracial marriage. So what happens is there had been, at the time in 1967, 16 states that it was illegal for a black person to marry a white person. And 1967, that's struck down and, and that's declared unconstitutional. 1968, this is the Civil Rights Act. Um, now this one is, so you had the first one that was about employment and it makes discrimination illegal. Now this Civil Rights Act of 1968 is specifically focused on housing, okay? That is illegal to discriminate on housing based on race. There's the thing though. So even if you're gonna make it illegal, like remember how I said like there was those covenants that said like, you can only sell this house to a, a Caucasian person, you can only sell it to a white person, things like that. That kind of stuff now becomes illegal. You, you can't ban that. Okay, here's the problem though. What happens is, is that like, discriminate, like the, the fact that we have like white neighborhoods and black neighborhoods, some of that was due to laws, granted. But you also have what now at this point, you still have black neighborhoods and white neighborhoods. Even though it's unconstitutional, even though the laws have been changed, you still today, especially in the north, supposedly down south, it's not as bad. But in the north, especially where, where I live, I'm in Long Island. I'm in Nassau County, Long Island. I'm in New York. This is one of the New York's one of the worst places in the country for segregated housing. And it's because the segregation is what we call de facto segregation. What ends up happening is, again, I think I showed you uh, on another video about Adam Ruins Everything, where he talks about redlining. This is an example where you can see how they used to literally, the government, this is from the government, used to set out a map and determine, like, what were the good neighborhoods, what were the bad neighborhoods. And, of course, you know, the, the hazardous neighborhoods would be the black neighborhoods. And once they drew these lines on a map, that determined whether or not you'd be eligible for mortgages and things like that. So that really hurt black ownership of property so it kept down um and that was a huge way for people to gain weight uh, gain gain weight gain wealth is is home ownership and then um you also had like i said housing covenants that had been in place so what happens is you develop these black and white neighborhoods now the problem is is once those housing patterns are established it's really hard to fix it so what do i mean by that let's say grandma buys a house Okay. And grandma buys it during this era where there was redlining, where there was restrictive covenants and all this. So grandma owns a house. Well, grandma dies. Who's going to inherit the house? Her kids. And her kids are going to be just as white as grandma is. And you tend to see like the neighborhood stays the same race. You get what I'm saying? Because the housing pattern. A lot of kids, I mean, if you think about, you know, where you live versus where your parents live, like me, my, I grew up you know, three towns over from where I live now. It, it's not uncommon for kids to live, you know, to buy houses in the same neighborhoods where they grew up. And once those kinds of patterns are established, 
they, it's they're very hard to change. Um, you know, like I, I live in Merrick. Merrick is generally a white neighborhood. Don't get me wrong. There's a couple. Of, there's my kids go to school, and there's a couple of black kids. There's a couple of um, there's a couple of uh, Asian kids. There's a couple of East Asian kids. You know, like dark skinned Indian kids and dark, Hispanic kids, or whatever. So there's a couple, but it's predominantly white. And you know, this is hard when it comes to housing patterns. It's tough. Because, yeah, if, if you want to live, if, if you're an African-American and you want to live in Merrick, knock yourself out. There's a house down the block. Feel free to buy it. You you can buy it. Go ahead. But for a lot of African-American kids, it's like, I don't, you know, do I want to be the black kid in the white school? You know, even if your parents have, you know, a great job and can afford it and have the money, whatever. It's hard. Do you want to be the, you know, the one black kid in the white town? You know what I mean? And that's that's hard. Um, but, you know, like I said, it's starting to break down, but it's going to take a long time. Once these kinds of customs, once these things are established, they're much harder to change. The law, you can change like this, but the patterns where people live, those, that takes a long time to fix. All right. So, like I said, I could talk, this topic is humongous. There's no way I could, there's a million other things I could talk about. I could teach this one topic you know, for years, uh, I could, I could teach multiple top uh, things on it. Um, if you wanted to learn more, this is just, you know, just, just a, a selection of kind of topics and interesting things. You know, James Baldwin, he's, he's amazing. Like some of the great artists, um, who, you know, uh, that speak on these issues and, and have a, a really interesting and important things to say about race. Muhammad Ali was like a legendary figure. He, he is groundbreaking. Katherine Johnson, the, the legend from Hitting Figures, um, you know, uh, Raisin in the Sun, another great artistic piece. And the story of Jackie Robinson desegregating baseball and the whole idea of white privilege, like, you know, what it is and what it isn't. And, you know, and and then racism towards Asian Americans, like, you know, maybe there's African Americans, but, you know, other groups that have had to deal with it. And the Black Lives Matter movement. What is it? What isn't it? I, there's so much stuff that we could go into, but I don't have time. And I've already gone way over my 40 minutes, so I apologize. But anyway, uh, thank you so much for paying attention. I really appreciate it. All right. Bye bye.